ahead and go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome, everybody. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Pastor Greg Hintz. On behalf of myself and the leadership team, we want to welcome you today. You picked a great Sunday to be here. I mean, come on, you got water baptisms, free food, and a brand new series started. Trifecta of awesomeness. Absolutely. It's going to be great. Well, today's day, we're starting a brand new series, and our brand new series that we're starting is simply called this, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fire from heaven. And you know, I love how God works because we planned this sermon series probably about three months ago. And just even in the research of coming up to this day, I found out that Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday. But we didn't plan it that way. God planned it that way. And he lined everything up for us. So it's going to be a great series that we're talking about as we talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, I know for a lot of us, we're coming into this maybe at different levels, different places, different understanding. My goal is no matter where you are, that you're going to be able to leave here today with something that you can apply to your life. That's my goal. That's what I really want to see for each and every single person here. And, you know, whenever you talk about the Holy Spirit, there's lots of different thoughts, lots of different ideas uh, that go around. I heard this story about a pastor who had preached, he just preached a regular sermon, and at the end of the sermon, he was standing by the door as people were walking out, he would shake everybody's hand. And as he was shaking uh, this one lady's hand, she, she said, you know, Pastor, that was a really good sermon you just preached. And he looked back and said, well, that was all the Holy Spirit. And she said it wasn't that good. So uh, I hope that by the end of this series, we don't have a repeat of that. You know, anytime that anyone in church, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we look at one day. One day that pops up in the New Testament. And that day is the day that I just alluded to. is known as the day of Pentecost. Now, we're going to be talking about that in depth next week. So we're not going to go too uh, far there. Today, I actually want to look at before Pentecost. Like, was the Holy Spirit active before that? Because really, a lot of people think that's the defining moment where everything changed. But the reality is the Holy Spirit has been busy and at work this entire time. But before we dive into God's Word today, I really have a question for you. And the question I have for you at the very start of the sermon today, the very start of the series, is simply this. If someone were to ask you this question, who is the Holy Spirit? How would you answer them? So who, who, who can help me with that? If someone were to ask you, who is the Holy Spirit, how would you answer them? Hmm. God. God. Okay, great. God. Who else? God, yes? The helper. The, the helper. said that would come to us. The helper. Good. That Jesus said would come to us. Awesome. Who else? Yes. Our Savior. Savior. All right. You know, so good. One more. I was like, no, 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 no. Yes. Creator. Creator. Oh, good. These are all great thoughts, concepts, ideas. And, and one that by the end of this series, my goal is that we can be confident and not only understand how to communicate it, but where to point people in the Bible to have a thorough understanding of the Holy Spirit. Now, for today's conversation, I want you to grab your Bible. If you didn't bring your Bible, I put one underneath the seat for you this morning. And I want you to grab that. And I want you to go ahead and I want you to uh, go ahead and turn all the way back to the very first book in the Bible, the book of, of Genesis. Now, you know what? We're, we're going to do better. We're going to go to the very first chapter in the very first book, Genesis chapter 1. No, you know what? We're going to do better now. We're going to go to the very first verse in the first chapter of the first book of the entire Bible, okay? And we're going to start our conversation about the Holy Spirit right at the beginning of the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Check it out. Here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. You see, from the very beginning of creation, we see the Holy Spirit active and present in that very place. Now, I love when we read Scripture because what, the description that we see of the Spirit of God here is the Spirit of God is doing something specifically, is hovering over the waters. Now, this word in Hebrew, I think, is only used three times in the entire Old Testament. 
Now, this, the, but the meaning of the word to me really opened up my eyes a lot. Here's what this word hovering literally means. It means to be moved and affected with the feeling of tender love. It means to cherish. The other place that we find this word is actually in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 11. Here's what it says. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spread its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. There's this picture of this bird with, with, with the, their children hovering over, protecting, but still pulling them out of the nest, causing them to grow, causing them to, to, to expand, to become a strong enough to fly on their own. There's this picture of this bird hovering over their young. Now, why do I tell you that? Because there's lots of different thoughts when it comes to the creation of the earth, but this one is different than all the others. Maybe one of the most common thoughts of the myth of creation comes from Babylon. And it's known as the Babylonian myth of creation. And I want you to contrast what you just heard from the Bible to what the Babylonians taught. And here was their myth of creation, their belief of how everything began. It was chaos that was an enemy that needed to be conquered. Listen to those words. Chaos that was an enemy that needed to be conquered. Now, here you are, this idea in Babylon of, of what the world was like at the very beginning. But then you see the Bible talking about a formless mess that is to be loved, that is to be fostered into being. One of the earliest Jewish commentaries on this text in Genesis chapter 1 dated all the way back to New Testament times. And he interpreted it this way. He said... A spirit of love before the Lord was blowing and hovering over the face of the waters. And I tell you that because at the very beginning, at the very creation, we see that our God is a God of care, not a God of chaos. That he is a God of love as the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the waters even at that very earliest place in that earliest time. Now, if we went on in the book of Genesis chapter 1, we would see that not only was the Holy Spirit present in the creation of the earth, and the creation of the waters, and the creation at that very first moment, but also in the creation of mankind. Look at it. In Genesis chapter 1, the first part of verse 26. Here's what we read. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. Now, I don't know if you noticed anything strange about that. I still remember the first time I read it. I said, I read God, and in my mind, God is singular. I don't see an S there. But then I see the wording now becomes plural. You see that? Then God said, let us make man in our image. So I read that, I'm like, what does that mean? I had to research it and really begin to understand what that meant. Well, in Hebrew, when we see the word that is used for God over and over again throughout the Old Testament, it's this word Elohim, Elohim. Now, Elohim is actually the plural of the Hebrew name for God of El or Eloah. And so we see this picture of Elohim, let us make man in our image, even from the very first chapter in the book of Genesis. Now, probably if you've been serving the Lord for a while, you understand that this points to the doctrine that we understand as three is one, known as the Trinity. Trinity. That's right. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That God is all of these. This is the picture of the Trinity. From Genesis chapter 1, we see that being evident. Let us make man in our image. So we see even at the creation of man, the Holy Spirit was active and the Holy Spirit was present in that moment. And so when we look back at the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit, we see that the Holy Spirit has always been and the Holy Spirit will always be that he is the third person in the Trinity. 
See, that's important for us to understand because the Holy Spirit just didn't appear at Pentecost. Oh, there's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, welcome to earth. You know, he's like, man, I've been there. He's been there. He's been active and present the entire way. In fact, when we get into the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was active in the lives of the people in the Old Testament. See, it's not like the Holy Spirit just appeared after Jesus died and rose again. He was active in the Old Testament. Now, the reason that a lot of us may not really realize that is because we don't really see that the term Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. There's different ways that the Holy Spirit is described in the Old Testament. Here are just a few. We see the Spirit of the Lord. We see my Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit of God. We even see your Spirit. So these are different terms that are used to describe the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the lives of the Old Testament saints. And so we say, okay, the Holy Spirit was present. We see that now. He was active. What did he do? What was the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Well, the Holy Spirit, he taught people in the Old Testament. He was actively teaching people. The Spirit of the Lord was teaching the Old Testament saints. You know, a lot of us remember the story of the Israelites. When the Israelites escaped Egypt, they came to a big body of water that was known as the... Right? You guys watched the Prince of Egypt too. Uh, yes, and uh, came to the Red Sea, right? The Red Sea, miracles happen, all these great things happen. But the Israelites ended up wandering around for a while, okay? They're wandering around in the desert. In that season when they were in the desert, they had to rely completely and entirely on God. God led them and God fed them. God took care of all of their needs. Now there's this guy, Nehemiah, in the Old Testament, and he was talking about this season of time in the Israelites' life. And we read it in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 20. Here's what he said. He said, you sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. And so we see the Holy Spirit was evident there. The Holy Spirit was teaching them in their lives. Now, we're not just here to look back because it's very important when we come to church that we have to look right here in our lives too. So as we look at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, I also want to look at the, whole, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life today. So my question for you, and you don't have to answer this out loud, but I want you to answer it in your heart, so I want you to answer it in your mind. Let's start our journey asking this question. What is the Holy Spirit teaching? Is the Holy Spirit teaching? Teaching you. When you look at your life right now, can you see the Holy Spirit teaching you things right now? Because the Holy Spirit is a great teacher. He wants to teach you in your life. Now, for some of us, we may look back and say, I don't really know. What does that mean? Like, is this a community college course? Do you sign up? Holy Spirit 101? You know, what does this look like really for the Holy Spirit to teach me? Well, the Holy Spirit is actively moving in our lives even today, and he uses lots of different avenues to teach us. I'm just going to share with you just a couple that I've seen of the Holy Spirit use in my life, and maybe you've seen him use it in your life too. I mean, the first avenue that I see a lot is that the Holy Spirit will use others. He'll use people. He will send people into your life. He will empower them and give them the wisdom to give you. Many of you would not be sitting here right now if the Holy Spirit had used somebody to reach out into your life. Someone to share wisdom with you, to, to, to uh, pray for you, to be there for you when you needed them. So the Holy Spirit has used other people in your life to help teach you. Now maybe for some of you, you need to be that other person for somebody else. Maybe it's time that you take what God has given you and you begin to pour it into the life of another person or you begin to reach out like someone reached out in your life. But other people is a great way that the Holy Spirit uses to teach us in our life. Now, not only other people, there's another great way that the Holy Spirit works in our life, and that's through using the Word of God. The Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God to speak to our hearts and speak to our lives, to teach us and to train us. There's many times in my life when 
I open up the Bible and I start reading, and it could be a verse that I've read a hundred times, a thousand times, and I, I come to this verse and I reach this moment where it's like a hand comes up out of the Bible, smacks me across my face, and then goes back down. You ever had that happen? That's fun. That's fun right there. And what I mean by that is, is there's this verse, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, but in this moment, it's not a verse on paper, it's a verse penetrating my soul and my spirit and my life. It's a verse that is changing me. You know, this Bible, it says, is alive, living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit, can speak to our hearts and give us the wisdom that we need today to live. But for a lot of us, what we have to do is the wisdom's there, the Holy Spirit is ready to use this thing, but we need to go home, we need to pick it up and... <laughs> Get all the dust off of it, right? Crack it open and allow God to speak through his word into our lives. Because the Holy Spirit wants, there's things in your life right now you desperately need wisdom on. Some of you, you're about to make the wrong decision. You're not listening, right? You're not opening yourself up to God's word to hear what he wants you to do in your life. Some of you are so frustrated and frustrated with life where it is. And I'd say, have you even gone to the instruction book? Have you taken some time to get in this thing? And sometimes you may start reading and be like, oh, but this is boring, this is that. I, I'm going to teach you this. If you'll stay disciplined, God will speak. If you'll just continue on, even through those boring chapters. Listen, I've gone through Leviticus a couple times. And there's times in the middle I want to stop. But you know what? I keep flipping that page. Last time I read Leviticus, it was one of the best books I've ever read. I read it before I almost fell asleep, but I read it again and it spoke to me. Why? There was stuff in there I needed to hear in that season of my life. There were things in there that made sense. So I want to encourage you. Is this thing coming into your life every day? I'm going to tell you if you say, I'm going to read three chapters of the Bible. That's going to take you about 12 and a half minutes every single day. If you watch one one-hour TV show, you're watching about 20 minutes worth of commercials. Unless you have a DVR like me. Uh, you know, so think about that. 12 and a half minutes. That's how long three chapters are each and every single day. And what's going to happen is that wisdom is going to come through that. Seeds are going to be planted in your heart that are going to... Come, come to fruition at just the right moment right when you need it. Does that make sense? Now let me tell you another way, and this is an often overlooked way that the Holy Spirit can speak to our lives and teach us today, and that's through experience. Things that you've done in your life in the past, the Holy Spirit can use to teach you today. Now for some of you, it's the mistakes that you've made, right? The things that you've done that you look back and you wish you wouldn't have done. See, what the Holy Spirit can do is when you're in another season, when you're about to go down that same road, he can bring to remembrance what happened in that time. And then you think to yourself, oh, I don't want to go down that road again. I remember where that road took me. I don't want to do that again. And so that changes your life today. And so we can learn from our own mistakes. We can learn from the mistakes of other people that we see or we have saw or that we have learned about. And, and, and we learn, and the Holy Spirit will quicken that inside of our spirit and, and lead us in another direction. You know, a lot of us have probably heard that before. But I'm going to tell you, what about the other side of things? The Holy Spirit can use the victories of your life to teach you. He can use those moments when it made no sense, but you felt the Holy Spirit was directing you in a certain way, and you're like, it doesn't make any sense, but I really believe God, God wants me to do this, or God wants me to do that. And you take that step, and he shows up. And, he, and, and you're like, wow, God, you showed up. I didn't have the strength, the knowledge, the ability to do any of this, but you did it through me. Now you're going to come to another crossroad. God's going to call you to something else. And you're going to be like, I can't do it. And he's going to be like, but do you remember when? Do you remember that moment before when you said those exact same words, but you had the courage to follow me? And you took that first step, and God showed up. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit is going to encourage you to continue to step forward. So God can use your experiences, both the good ones and the bad ones, to come back to you, to lead you and guide you, and to give you the wisdom that you need to move forward. So the Holy Spirit absolutely is in the business of teaching us today. The other thing that as we look at the Old Testament, the, another way that we see the Holy Spirit moving is that the Holy Spirit, His presence... <laughs> Pointed people to God. His presence pointed people to God. What do I mean by that? I mean when someone was serving God, people noticed. When the Holy Spirit was evident in someone's life, people were like, man, what is up with that dude? 
You see it from this one guy. He was actually uh, the son of David. He got a little famous. What was his name? Solomon. Solomon, exactly. Solomon, the son of David. He became king, right? God said, I'll give you whatever you want. I could have asked for money, stuff, land, conquered the entire world. What did he ask for? Wisdom. And he said, I want wisdom because I want to lead your people. God said, I'm going to give you wisdom and so much more. God just exploded in his life with so much wisdom, so much goodness. Uh, Solomon became the richest person on the entire planet. Things were going great uh, for Solomon. And here's what happened. As he followed God, people began to notice the hand of God on his life. People began to notice there was something different about Solomon. There was one lady, she was actually a queen at the time. She was known as the Queen of Sheba. She actually traveled because she heard of the wisdom of Solomon. She wanted to learn from Solomon. She wanted to spend time with Solomon, being like, man, there's something different about you. I want to know what that is. If you want to read about that later, you can in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 10. You know, a lot of times, though, people think they just went to see, she just went to see him because of the stuff that he had. But the reality is that she went not just for that, but she went to see about his relationship with the Lord. The word had spread all about Solomon, that Solomon had a connection with God. People saw how God was blessing Solomon in his life. And so the Queen of Sheba travels and she learns about that. Now, let me ask you a question in your life today. My question is simply this. Who has been drawn to God because of the Holy Spirit's work in your life? Who has been drawn to God because of the Holy Spirit's work in your life? In other words, because of what the Holy Spirit is doing, someone looks and they notice, we're like, man, there's something different about you. Or what's going on here? And, and that has opened the door for ministry. You know, Jesus, he, he made it so clear for us. He says, you know, we're called to be a city on a hill. He said we're, we're like a light. And that light is not supposed to be hidden. That light is supposed to be for the world to see. He said, you know, that we're called to let our light shine before men. That they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of us, not just for us, but to shine out into the world. The darker it gets, the brighter we become. Are people seeing you shine? Is the Holy Spirit shining in you and shining through you? In the Old Testament, we see that that was happening often in the lives of, of the uh, Old Testament characters and people that we read about. Let me tell you one more thing, one more thing. Last fact is this, the Holy Spirit empowered people to complete a task. In fact, this is probably the biggest difference between the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit would come into someone's life for a season to do something, to get something done. And then sometimes it would look like, well, where's the Holy Spirit now? In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes into our life and never goes anywhere. Is with us to the very end and then some, you know? So in the Old Testament we read, sometimes it was for a purpose, sometimes it was for a season, and sometimes it was for a reason. In Exodus 31, we read about one of these individuals in verses 1 through 3. It says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying this, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And hear this part right here. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. I don't know if you noticed that last part. I thought that was interesting when I first read it. Look at that very last line. In all manner of workmanship. You know, sometimes we don't see the Spirit of God associated with the workmanship that we do, or our job, or our career. But let me tell you, the two are intertwined. God gives us a grace, gives us an anointing, sometimes to do the work that we're doing. That there's gifts, and skills, and talents that are on the inside of you that the Holy Spirit has given you because He has a plan and a purpose for you. And it could be all kinds of different things. You may have a gift of organization. That can be used for God's glory. You may have the gift of gab. All right? You guys can hug as you can. All right. And uh, that could be used for God's glory. Some of you have wisdom. That could be used for God's glory. Some of you guys are able to counsel. That could be used for God's glory. 
So we see the Holy Spirit is using that. Time and time again, there were certain things that were given to people in the Old Testament that truly were powerful, powerful tools that were used by them for God's glory. I mean, we see the faith of Moses. We imagine where we would be right now, that faith of Moses that God had empowered him to have. A time to believe even when it didn't make sense. To be able to do some of the things that he did. Amazing. We look at the courage of Abram when he was told at the age of 70 to leave his hometown, to leave everything and go on this new trail. He didn't know where he was going. He didn't know where he was going to end up, but he still had to have the courage to do that. God allowed him to have the courage in order to leave. And because of what he did, great things followed. And I even think about someone like Samson. If you ever read Samson's story, it doesn't seem like it ends too well for the guy, right? Uh, but the Spirit of God was upon him and gave him a supernatural strength. And that strength was the strength, watch this, that pointed to God. Now my question for you this morning about this is simply this. I've talked about all these people in the, in the Old Testament. I've talked about all these people through the Bible. My question for you is simple. What about you? What's your gift? What's your talent? What has God placed on the inside of you? What is there that God has given you that he wants you to give to the world? Because sometimes, you know what, we get in the rut. We're, we're, we're just in the job or in the, the thing. We're just doing, doing, doing. And we're so consumed. And before you know it, a decade passes. And we look back and we're like, man, how did I get here? And we forget what God had placed on the inside of us for us to use for his glory on this earth. But we're so busy doing and we're so busy getting things or getting stuff that we forget about. Listen, and I didn't say this in any other service, so this is for somebody that's here right now. God has a greater goal for you other than making money. God has a greater goal for you than getting the next race. That there are gifts and talents that he has placed on the inside of you that he wants you to use for his glory. The, the problem is sometimes we get so distracted and so stuck in the rut that we need to break free. Have the courage of Abram. Get up and get going and follow after what God has for you. What in your life is the Holy Spirit empowering you to do right now? Each and every, if you're following Jesus, there's something right now that the Holy Spirit has you to do in your life. What is it? Now, sometimes we look at these stories in the Old Testament. They're so, so big and so great. We think of Noah building a big boat. Ah, I can't do that. We think of Moses leading a million people around the desert. We're like, I don't want to do that, you know? Uh, there's all these different things. But I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit can empower you to do sometimes the most simple things that can have the most profound impact on you. For example, for some of you sitting in this church right now, you need the Holy Spirit to empower you to forgive. There's someone in your life you need to forgive, and you can't do it on your own. That hurts you too bad. What they did was wrong. You cannot do it without the intervention of the Holy Spirit on your life. But he can do it if you surrender and you allow him to do it. Maybe for others it's not forgiven. Maybe it's praying for somebody. you got that gift of prayer. There's people in your life that need you to intercede, that need you to pray for them. Maybe for others, it's love. Man, you got this gift, this compassion on the inside of you, and you just need to pour that out into this world. God has given you that gift for a reason. For some of you, it's to plan, to plan for the future, plan for others. For others, it's serving, like just getting in there and getting involved. Right now, you just, you're, 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 you're cut off from everybody else, and you just need to get in there and begin to serve. For others, it's just to give. God has blessed you with the gift of financial wisdom and understanding. God has blessed you financially. You need to get in there and just start giving. That's a gift that he's placed on the inside of you. This one is one that a lot of times we overlook. And it's the last one I want to talk about. For some of you, move on. For sometimes we get so stuck in this rut, stuck in this place, where we have to reach a place where we understand, the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to be here anymore. I'm willing to move past it. When we talk about forgiveness, that's what it means. Forgiveness does not mean you're going to forget. Forgiveness means that you're going to keep moving. For some of you, your lack of forgiveness has kept you in this rut. This rut keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Forgiveness says, you know what? I'm going to move on. I'm going to keep moving. I'm not going to stay there. I think it was D.L. Moody who was uh, preaching one time. And he had this great illustration. And it's an illustration that I think it made a lot of sense to me. And maybe it'll make a lot of sense to you. He brought out this vase. And when he brought out this vase, he uh, simply held it up for everybody. 
And uh, he simply said, you know what? Inside of this vase is air. And if you don't know too much about science, there's a little drip of water too. I'll get rid of that. All right. There's air on the inside of this vase. And it's filled with air. And his question to the audience was simply this. How can I get all the air in the vase? And so there's some really smart people that were out there. And they're like, well, if you do this vacuum suction thing, you can hook it up and it would suck out all of the air. And it would, he was like, no, nah, I couldn't do that because... He was sort of smart, too. He said, I couldn't do that because at the level of suction that would come out, this vase would actually implode, and it would explode, and it would be worth nothing. And so he got a few more answers, and none of them were really good. But he looked at him and says, you know what? There is a way that you can get all of the air out of this vase. And see, I think in our lives, a lot of time, we are consistently trying to get the air out of our vase. And maybe for some of us, that's taking these things out of our life that we don't want anymore. I need to fix this, and I need to fix that, and I need to stop doing this, and I need to start doing that. And we find all of these different areas, and that's what we're doing. We're trying to pull air out of a vase. We're trying to fix something. But as he was looking over this, this congregation, he says, there's only one way to get rid of all the air inside of this vase. And he picked up this pitcher, and he took this pitcher, and he just started pouring it into his face. And he said, it's only at this... Oh, it is. Ah. It's only at this point right here that there's no longer any air in the face. You know, a lot of us in our lives, especially if we're trying to follow Jesus, or, you know, we feel like we need to be a good Christian, or we feel like we need to get our lives together, what we're doing is we're spending all of our time simply trying to pull air out of the vase. God would look at you today and say, he wants you to stop, start spending less time trying to pull things out and spend more time putting something in. Because at this point, there is no more air in the vase, but it's not because I took anything out of the vase. It's because I put something into the vase. For a lot of us in our lives, this is God's presence, the Holy Spirit. This is a trust and a reliance in Him and Him alone. Not in our good deeds, not in our good works, not in our ability to pull air out of a vase, but a trust in Him and Him alone. That's the first step of what it means. Now you look at me and say, okay, I get it. I fill my life with the Holy Spirit, and then that's good. Now how do I do that? For that... You have to come back next week for part two. <laughs> Let's pray. Bow your heads. Lord God, I thank you so much. You are just such a good God. You are filled with such love and grace and compassion for each and every single person that is here right now. We started the journey today really looking at you, Holy Spirit, and you throughout history and you throughout God's word and the work that you have done. And we will look at the work that you are doing. We know that not only were you alive and well in the lives of the Old Testament prophets, but you are alive and well in our lives too. In the same way that you had a plan and a purpose for them, you have a plan and a purpose for us today too. I pray, Lord, that in the next few weeks that we grow in a way that we've never grown together as a faith community. That we begin to learn what it means to live and to trust, to follow you no matter what. To allow you to penetrate our hearts, to hear what you have to say for us, not be concerned about what we want, but only want to follow you and walk in obedience to you. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this church to have your way. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives to have your way. Holy Spirit, we want to be changed by your presence, and we trust that not only in the next few weeks, but from this moment forward in this church, that we will be a church that is continually hearing you, following you, and being changed by you. Give us the courage to step when we need to step. Give us the courage to be quiet when we need to be quiet. And give us the courage, Lord, to follow you no matter where you take us. And I know in this church right now that there's some that hear about this life of being filled with the Spirit, this, this, 
lack of having to try to fix everything and pull everything out that needs pulled out, but just this trust and this belief and this obedience of following after Christ. And you're here. And you say, that's what I want. I've been sitting here my whole life trying to pull things out. I just, I just want to follow Jesus. I just want to trust Him. I just want to surrender my life. I, I just want to see what He has for me. And, and I'm ready to go wherever He's going to take me. Listen, if you're here and that's you, you can begin that journey with Jesus right now. Today, this is your moment. I'm going to ask you to do something. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do two things. If that's you, you say, that's what I want. I want to begin my journey with Jesus. I want to follow after him. Here's what I want you to do. I just, I want you to lift up your hand, and I want you to lift up your eyes, and I want you to look at me. I see you. Who else would say, that's what I want? I see you. I see you. I see you. Anyone else? Hands all over this place say that this is their day. This is the moment where everything changes. And I know a lot of people here are already following Jesus. I want you to say this prayer with those that are saying this prayer for the very first time. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Take it and do with it whatever you want. I'm sorry for my past. But I'm excited about my future because today is a day where everything changes. Let me just pray for you. God, I pray for each and every single person that just prayed that prayer. Let the words of their mouth be a reality in their hearts and their lives. Let this be a date and time where everything changes in their lives. I just pray that you'll pour out grace and blessing and love and peace that has never been experienced in your life before. Let it be present and evident today in them and through them. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're here and you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you just to do a couple of things. First, tell someone about it. Maybe it's someone that brought you here, someone that you know loves Jesus. Let them know, hey, I'm, I'm following Jesus now. Also, I want you just to start to pray, just start to talk to God. Maybe even on the drive home, you just, you know, hey, God, thanks so much for saving me. Thanks so much for what you did in my life. And the last thing I want you to do is, is take that Bible. If you got one home, dust it off. You need to take one. Take one from our church. They're underneath the seats. Find one, take one, be blessed. The only thing we ask if you take one is that you start reading it. Now, I know it's a big book. You may not know where to start. I always tell people, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the story of Jesus through four different eyes. Books that changed my life, and I believe books that can change your 